Want to make sure you never miss a new release from the official Creepypasta.com YouTube channel again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. For some reason, people think that lockdowns aren't a serious thing. They are. They can be the most terrifying experience of your life, and if you're unlucky, the last experience. Lockdown drills have this strange aura around them. I'm sure it's partly due to the silly lockdown drills everyone goes through in their time in public school. Everyone in your class huddled up in a corner with the lights off and door locked, just waiting for the principal to announce the end of the drill, only to return to the monotony of regular school life. I went through countless lockdown drills, and despite the school's attempt to prepare me for the real thing, I was anything but when the day of a real lockdown came. I come from a relatively small town in Arkansas. It isn't a small enough town that everybody knows each other, but it is still pretty small nonetheless. The school is right in front of a forest that goes out for miles. If you go through this forest in the right direction, you'll eventually find a prison. There has always been talk of a prisoner escaping and coming to the school, but it was never serious. I'm not sure exactly how far the prison is, but the teachers always did a good job of reassuring us that it's way too far to walk to the school from. The day the lockdown happened was very groggy and dark. I remember that I missed the bus that morning and I had to catch a ride with my friend Andrew. Him and I were best friends and had been from a very young age. I can still remember the way he laughed at my jokes. Anyway. When we got to the school, it was just a normal day for the first two periods. I had geography and algebra which totally sucked. The cool thing about my schedule was that Andrew was in most of my classes with me, so even the boring classes were somewhat bearable. When the bell to math class began to ring, I was a little startled, but my surprise quickly turned to excitement because Andrew and I had gym class next. We always enjoyed ourselves there. It was the only period in school where I actually felt like I did something. Most of the time we played some version of dodgeball or flag football when the weather permitted. When we got to gym, Andrew realized he'd forgotten his shorts in his normal locker, which was on the other side of the school. Luckily for him, there weren't any shorts in the lost and found pile, which the gym teacher normally made us wear if we forgot our shorts. Andrew asked to get his shorts and the teacher agreed. He also gave me permission to go with him as he knew we were best friends. There was something about walking in those halls without all the usual traffic that felt so cool. Have you ever had that feeling? It, it just feels more, I don't know, open. Well, the mesmerizing feeling of being in the empty halls would wear off soon enough. When we got to Andrew's locker, I decided to use the bathroom which was only a few steps away. The second I unleashed the floodgates, the principal, in a worried and shaky voice, announced over the intercom that we were going into a lockdown. I immediately freaked out and started thinking about where the nearest classroom was. In only a few seconds, I mentally planned out what I was going to do once I finished. I was going to run out of the bathroom, grab Andrew, and rush to the faculty room which was just around the corner. Once I was done, I made my way out of the bathroom and heard something that sounded out of place. It almost sounded like a scream, but I couldn't be sure due to the sound of the self-flushing urinal. I could feel myself getting more and more anxious as the moments passed. My terror came to a climax when I turned the corner to see that Andrew was gone. His locker was left open, and his shorts were lying on the floor where he'd been standing. I glanced in both directions, but he was nowhere to be found. Neither was anyone else, for that matter. I tried calming myself down and, and just began to think that Andrew must have just left to get to safety. I ran to the faculty lounge and knocked on the door. They let me in and to my surprise, Andrew wasn't there. From there I figured he went in the other direction which didn't really make any sense. There were just lockers upon lockers for a while, but I assumed he just made a bad judgement call. As I sat in the carpeted lounge area with a few teachers and one other student who looked to be scared out of her mind, I started to think more and more about Andrew. How the hell could he just leave me like that? I'm his best friend and he just left with no consideration for me at all. I started to think. Actions speak louder than words. 
The more I thought about it, the more the idea of Andrew being a bad friend grew on me. Maybe he was always like this and I just didn't notice because we were never in a serious situation. The one time I needed him to be there for me, he wasn't there. Before the end of the lockdown, I decided that I wasn't going to be Andrew's friend anymore. It was a really long time before the lockdown actually ended. Probably an hour or two at least. When it did, we were sent home early, sitting on the uncomfortable bus seat and staring out the window. I saw police officers there, and I wondered if anyone was hurt. The next day, I was called into the principal's office and they asked me a whole bunch of questions about the day prior. I told them how I was in the bathroom and when I got out, Andrew was gone. I knew something was up when my principal gave me an empathic look. I'll never forget the words that came out of her mouth. I'm sorry to say, but your friend, Andrew, is missing. Nobody has seen him since the lockdown. I had no idea what to say. I just sat there in silence, stunned for a while. Finally, they asked if I wanted to talk to somebody and I told them no. The rest of the day was a blur. The only other thing I remember from that day was the guilt washing over me. Here I was, blaming Andrew for not being there for me when it was really I who was not there for him. I later learned that they believed the man who broke into the school, an escaped prisoner, kidnapped Andrew. They weren't able to find him. Years later, there haven't been any leads, and nobody knows what the hell to do. Most people have accepted that Andrew was probably dead. But that isn't even the worst part. The worst part is knowing that the escaped convict who kidnapped him was serving a prison sentence for human trafficking. If you were in school any time from the 1990s onwards, the chances that you've at least experienced a lockdown drill are extremely high. Maybe even an actual lockdown. Obviously not all of them end in tragedies. Schools can go into a lockdown because of a crime committed nearby, or because some parent forgot to wear their visitor badge, or for any myriad of reasons, most of which don't have much to do with an actual, legitimate threat to students. Better safe than sorry, right? I went to school in a post-Columbine world. Lockdowns were always taken very seriously, despite the fact that we lived in a fairly rural area where most people knew each other. There were regular petitions to allow teachers to carry guns in school. Who knew how long it might take the police to arrive if something were to ever happen? But I'm obviously not on this side of Reddit to debate gun control, so I'll get to the point. Most lockdowns are drills. I'm going to tell you about the one that was not. I've always been a pretty nervous, paranoid person. For example, throughout middle and high school, I despised being in the cafeteria because I always seemed to get stuck sitting in some corner, nowhere near an exit. It made me anxious, realizing just how much distance I'd have to get across to get out, even if something as innocent as a food fight broke out. In upstairs classrooms, occasionally, I'd glance out the windows and ponder where or not the drop might kill me, or if I'd make it out with just a broken arm or leg. In downstairs classrooms, I tended to sit near windows unless forced to sit somewhere else. Although this was admittedly also because I just like to look outside and daydream. But like most routines, after enough repetition, you can get used to almost everything. If you work in a school, you probably know this like the back of your hand. In the event of a lockdown, teachers are supposed to lock the door, turn out the lights, and herd the students into a part of the room that cannot be seen from the window panel in the door. This has always seemed a bit ridiculous to me. I once had an English class in a room where the only spot that you could not see people from the door was, ironically, right beside the door. The idea of us all just lining up there while someone jiggled the knob outside sounded horrifying. However, my one major concern was always what would happen if I were caught in one of these drills outside the classroom. Was I supposed to run and bang on the nearest door, hide in a closet, run outside? Privately, through my secondary school years, 
I always figured that if it came down to it, if I were near an exit and it seemed like the real deal, I'd take my chances running outside. Better out than in. Teachers never really told us during drills whether they were drills or not, but someone always knew. There was always one kid whose mom was a secretary who would whisper to everyone else that yeah, it wasn't real, and that we'd be having a fire drill sixth period tomorrow too. They have a special code for if it's real. A girl named Kelly once informed our entire algebra class, ignoring the teacher's glower. If they say lockdown three times, it's a drill. Four times, it's real. We all snickered, but what she'd said lingered in the back of my mind every time the principal went on the loudspeaker, voice crackling throughout the building. I always counted, always waiting for that fourth time. It never happened, of course. Eleventh grade swung around, now officially an upperclassman. I let a certain confidence seep into my walk. I was sixteen. Next year, I'd graduate. I was going to college. I practically owned this dump. I see everyone I hated working at McDonald's, you know, the usual 16 year old spiel. I no longer felt the need to rush into first period as if I were being pursued by wolves. Instead, I lingered in the hallway with other relaxed juniors and seniors, made fun of confused freshmen and actually made eye contact with teachers. This newfound skip in my step was what led me to cutting the first period bell very close as I wiped out my shirt with a wet paper towel in the bathroom. Someone had tripped on the bus and gotten what I prayed was iced coffee on it. The stain didn't look like it was coming out. And I hadn't brought a jacket. I groaned, balled up the paper towel and chucked it at the garbage. I missed. As I knelt down to pick it up, through the thick bathroom walls I heard the distant crackle of the loudspeaker. Were they starting morning announcements earlier this year? Maybe someone had parked in the teacher's spot again. Lockdown. 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 I was more caught off guard by the fact that it sounded like a secretary was making the announcement than anything else. Only after a moment or two did it sink in. This wasn't a drill. I stood there, completely motionless, wondering what the hell I was supposed to do. Finally, I lunged towards the door and yanked it open, peering out into the hall. Every door was shut. I was in the second floor. I thought I heard distant yelling from below. My panic began to settle into a slow, cold fear that pooled in the pit of my stomach and spread down my legs. I darted back into the bathroom, trying to rationalize things to myself. Maybe I'd misheard it, and it was just a drill. I tried to remember how the woman on the loudspeaker had sounded. Had she been frightened? Forced calm? I, I didn't know. The not knowing was the worst part. The police had to be on their way if it was real, I assured myself. So long as I stayed put, everything would be fine. What potential school shooter was going to check the bathroom? That said, I ran to the last stall, the one for people with wheelchairs and scrambled up on the toilet. Should I lock the stall door? No, there was no point. If they did come in, it'd be obvious someone was in there then. What if they somehow saw me through the small space in the door? Could I somehow wriggle on the ground from one stall to the next, evading them? By this point, I was slightly hysterical, but I knew, in the back of my mind, like you always know in these situations, if they did come in here, I would probably die. Ridiculously enough, I began preparing my last lines. What I would say, should I plead with them? But if it was someone I knew, Maybe I could talk them down. Maybe I couldn't even convince myself, never mind someone already homicidal. Should I try to be the hero and go for the gun? Right, and get shot in the face. Perhaps I could stall them. Stall. Them. And I started to laugh. I didn't know why. I was shaking, crouching on a grimy public school toilet seat, literally laughing about potty humor. My manic chuckles faded into harsh breathing and I concentrated on my knees. I told myself I wouldn't look up, no matter what. I thought I heard a loud noise from down the hall and flinched, although I had no idea what it had been. I tried to still my breathing and only succeeded in feeling faint. And then I heard it, footsteps. 
I was sure of it. Maybe it was a cop, I told myself, weakly. The footsteps drew nearer, echoing hollowly on the tiled floor of the school. I hadn't been raised to be religious. Right then and there, I started to make bargains. I didn't care if I got shot, as long as it didn't kill me or paralyze me. Actually, that, that might be worse. I just wanted to go home. If whoever was in charge of this shit just made sure I got home, I'd do whatever the hell they said to do for the rest of my life. Maybe they didn't have a gun. Maybe it was a knife. Maybe I could get out of here with a few nasty scars and a story. The door opened, and I went blank. I'm not sure how to describe it. I was there, and yet not there at all. I felt completely removed from the entire event. I was there in the stall, yeah, but I also wasn't. Like maybe it didn't really happen that much either way. I was beyond all of it. For a fleeting second, I wondered if I'd collapsed and died of fright. I knew they were there. I heard them. The first stall swung open with a groan, as did the second. I tried to close my eyes and found I couldn't. My eyelids refused to cooperate. Third stall. I was convinced I could hear them breathing. I wondered what they were thinking. Were they excited? Could they hear me breathing? God, I thought, don't let it be someone I know. Fourth stall. The loudspeaker crackled on. The lockdown is now completed. Students and staff, thank you for your cooperation. I heard them pause, and I heard them leave the bathroom door swinging quietly shut behind them. I didn't leave the stall for another five minutes. My first period teacher was very annoyed. I didn't really care. I told them what happened. He called the vice principal down. I told her what had happened. She seemed skeptical. I never heard any more about it. There was no evidence of anyone having gone in that bathroom during the lockdown, aside from what I claimed. But someone had been in there with me and they'd been so close to finding me. Of that, I was certain. It hadn't been a drill. It all started with a bell. A bell similar to the one I hear now, signifying that the one hour of free time is done. It's time to go back to my padded room. I took the cigarette lighter and slid it into my fingers and placed the cig in the lobe of my ear. Hell, I didn't even smoke, but the dude standing next to me gave it to me. I've been through this before. If you don't accept his smokes, he would carry on all day and then cry himself to sleep at night. I was tired of his voice. In fact, I was tired of voices. In a few seconds, he would tell me he was out of smokes and would need it back. In my mind, I counted one, two, three. Hey, you gonna smoke that? He asked me. I'm saving it for later, I replied. Well, uh, I'm out of smokes. Maybe I can borrow it back and smoke it on the way inside. I'll give you a new one tomorrow. Deal? Deal. I said. I grinned, shook my head, and gave him back the cigarette and lighter. He immediately lit the cigarette and repeated his usual verbiage. That was a deal, and I'll give you a new one tomorrow. Yes, yeah, I will. No worries, my little friend. Yup, new deal tomorrow. Ugh, I can't believe I'm here. I don't belong here. Hell, I was simply a witness to the screams. A witness to the shooting. That was real. This is surreal. They say I was the intended target, but it's not my fault what happened. I had no clue. I didn't know what he was either. I didn't know what he was after. Only weeks ago, life was good. Damn, it was good. In the past, I would never brag or carry on with this narcissistic bullshit which traps most of the people my age. But now, I needed to do so. I need to remember because they are going to erase it. My life was good. Real good. Played football, enough to be a contender for college ball. Got straight A's, had a hot girlfriend, now I have nothing and I'm locked away with the crazies. But I didn't do this to myself. I considered myself a good guy. I worked hard, football practice, homework, and did the church thing too. It's all in my throat now. I want to spit it out. 
They talk about an insane mind. Really? From when? Just a week ago? I saw the headlines in the news and on the social media until they banned me from looking at it. Hell, people wrote me about him. And I answered. I saw nothing unusual about that, but they did. They said I need help. Help to stop the voices. Help to get my life back. I didn't need help. I wanted to hear the voices, and I wanted them to hear me. I lost my people, and they lost me. I wanted to know everything that happened. No one would tell me if Kayla was alive or dead. I have no idea who's dead, if anyone. It changed because of him. I can't go back to not knowing. I wish I could. My life was very easy and fun. That's what you're supposed to have in high school, is fun, right? Once you hear or see something, it's with you. There's no getting rid of it. You can't just shake your head like an Etch-A-Sketch and be alright. That day. Fuck. That day. It started as any other day. I arrived at school at 6.30 for football practice. We drilled, we ran, hit the showers. Then, I met my lady Kayla at the lockers. Told her how hot she looked. The bell rang. I walked Kayla to her classroom and while walking to homeroom. And while walking to homeroom, it began. Inside of the cafeteria, I heard gunshots. <coughs> then, a moment of silence and someone said, Don't make me hurt you. Tell me where he is. Then, I saw him. He reached his hand out to me, but I ran toward the activity. But just as my legs began to move, they stopped. I was unable to move. I needed to get in there and save Kayla, but he wouldn't let me fucking move. Suddenly, a great white light overtook me. The feeling was like nothing else I'd ever experienced. I wouldn't say I was completely at peace, I was still worried about Kayla, but I felt much more calm than I had just moments ago. That's where my recollection of events ends. I woke up in the hospital. As one might imagine, I was livid. I screamed and yelled about finding the angel. I wasn't easily calmed down after that. Who would be? The worst part was that they didn't even tell me what happened. Once they got me with the crazy label, I was worth nothing to those people. Even my own parents wouldn't tell me what happened. I'm sure they've given up on me too. In the two or so weeks I've been locked up in here, they only visited me once. They could tell that I was getting restless and when I started yelling at them to tell me what happened, the staff sedated me. I have a feeling that everyone I know is dead and that's why they won't tell me. If they think I'm suffering from some kind of severe PTSD, schizophrenia bullshit, wouldn't news of all my friends' survival be something they'd tell me? Of course they would tell me. But I know that they would avoid telling me that everyone I knew was killed. As for him, I don't really know who he is. Is he my guardian angel? There's a good chance he prevented my death. But then again, Look where I am, stuck in this padded room, alone. Nothing but one question bouncing around in my head, like a ping pong ball. Did he save my life, or did he ruin it?